Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Pond5, the world's stock media marketplace. If you're a media maker looking for video, photos, illustrations, music, sound effects, after effects templates, or 3D models, check out Pond5. And for an exclusive 50 free stock media files, go to pond5.com slash frame rate. <laughs> How to deal with an attacker if he has a knife. Okay, come at me. So first thing you want to do is get the knife out of their hand. That's an incredibly important detail. So you grab, you put your arms up like this, and you want to avoid the knife. So when they attack you, you want to grab this hand, okay? Hit the knife like that and try to chop the back of the hand because you don't have a wall nearby. You want to chop the back of the hand until the knife comes out. If that doesn't work, you want to shake it as much as possible. Ideally, that'll shake off their mask, identifying them, but then you want to continue to shake it as much as you possibly can. <laughs> All right, go, go, go. What I want to do is... Welcome to Frame Rate, episode 110. I'm Tom Merritt. Hey, I'm Brian Brushwood, and that was an effective demonstration of how to defeat a toddler in the arena of combat. That's a, that's actually an old one from like two years ago, but it never quite hit a million views, so I thought it was underrepresented. It's called How no, to Fight, if you want to find no, it online. No, it will, because I don't know about your neighborhood, Brian, but mine, roving gangs of toddlers. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, they all have that adorable yeah. little Poogee belly and uh, they wear bandit masks like that one. Yeah. did. Yeah. It's just, it's just yeah. not safe to walk on a playground uh, <laughs> anymore. Well, let's, uh, let, let's get right into the show and talk about the big story. This just in the big story. Of course, the big story was going to be a couple of other things until finally this weekend, Disney and Lucasfilm confirmed that the unthinkable J.J. Abrams is going to direct Star Wars Episode Seven. Yes, yes, a million times, yes, times, the world is awesome. Do you realize, like, one of the most compelling arguments in all of the, the Phantom Menace review from Red Letter Media is this moment where they do side-by-side. -side. They, they take a scene from Star Trek showing how they got major plot points across while people were running and stuff was exploding all around them, and then they compared it to a, a, a similar scene where major plot points were, were expressed in the Phantom Menace, and it's just people standing there. Like, the, this makes me inordinately happy. J.J. Abrams has he's, he's captain of preserving mystery of engagement. Uh, I, I, he's never made a movie that I hated. Has he made anything that you've hated? Uh, he's made some stuff. Well, he's been an executive producer on some stuff that I didn't love. Uh, like what's that show on CBS where they try to predict crimes? It's not awful. Yeah, okay. You know, there's there's stuff like that. Movie wise, I can't think of one I've hated. Again, a couple of things. Maybe not as good as I, I would have liked from J.J. Abrams, but mostly love it. And I remember I saw Star Trek, his his Star Trek, in Hawaii, in Honolulu. And the first thing I posted to Twitter after the show was, Dear J.J. Abrams, can you please do Star Wars next? Well, he finally fi he listened. That's, that's I didn't think I, I, I didn't think he could do it because he's all wrapped up with the next. He's got another Star Trek that he's supposed to do after Into Darkness. I didn't what, think he was man, available. He can, he can run both of them as far as I'm concerned. As long as he keeps putting out this quality, I could not be happier. Uh, and I'll tell you what else. If you need another indication that, uh, and I don't know if you want to jump right into this right away, but if you want any question about whether or not Disney's going to do right by the Star Wars franchise, it's the fact that they indefinitely postponed the 3D version of the remaining uh, prequels, uh, Episode 2 and Episode 3. Everything they're doing is 100% right here. Yeah, no, absolutely. They're, if you didn't catch that, folks, those 3D, what many of you consider abomination versions of 
the second and third prequels uh, are not going to happen now. They, they, I, they I say think... they're not saying they'll never do them. They're saying we need to focus on episode seven. So this sort of lame attempt to revisit some movies that many of you actually find anathema anyway, we're going to ignore that for now. And we're going to focus think... on having J.J. Abrams make episode seven. Yeah, man. And uh, they mentioned who the writer for episode seven is going to be as well. I, I can't recall it offhand, but it's uh, I know he's Oscar nominated. Do you have that in front of you? Well, uh, consulting on the project is Lawrence Kasdan and Simon Kinberg. Kasdan, of course, oh, no, uh, It'll be was, by... was on The Empire Strikes Back. But the, but the writer uh, is, Michael, is uh, Arndt. Michael Arndt. Yes, Michael Arndt. Yeah, everything about this. This is what happens when you get dispassionate grownups who are consumed with only one thing, creating a, a high-quality legacy media and that's what disney once you divorce yourself from their long-term association with me with with kid stuff and yes they do a lot of kid stuff but you got to remember disney also brought you touchstone pictures and a lot of other high quality adult content as well once you look at them from a bird's eye view you see that disney is exceptionally good at demanding high quality they don't throw out a lot of junk into movie theaters and if they do if they do lower quality releases uh, they make sure to put them in distribution channels that make sense for us so they're not so much the naked cash grab that I think a lot of people were perceiving the Star Wars franchise was turning into. I, You know, and all the quotes uh, from J.J. Abrams are, this is surreal. Uh, it's an incredible thing. I was more of a fan of Star Wars than Star Trek growing up. I mean, he came right out and just admitted that. Honestly, now that, I, you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty, but let's say George Lucas gets on the phone with you, with J.J. Abrams and says, you know, J.J., we'd really like to have you on this I cannot see a possible scenario in which J.J. Abrams doesn't say, I will make this happen. I will find a way to fit my schedule to do this. You, you cannot well, I, turn that down if you're J.J. Abrams. Well, and I think, uh, I think it's a testament to what a true geek uh, he is. You know, there's no pretense. There's no cynicism in uh, in J.J. Abrams in his storytelling. And I think that's something I've always really dug about his work in general is you you see a little bit of the wide-eyed eight-year-old crafting stories with his action figures in the backyard. And I, I think he's going to be a fantastic steward. And I'm not going to say, like, only J.J. Abrams could do it. There's plenty of other fantastic filmmakers that could also make some magic. But I believe more in the Star Wars uh, universe's future now than I at, at any point since the release of The Phantom Menace. Well, and it just goes to show, when George Lucas owns his company and is in charge, no one questions George Lucas. Yes. Uh, I'm not even saying that George is making was making horrible decisions, but I get the feeling that even if George isn't a, a tyrant, even if he's just a nice guy, he's in charge. And people are like, you know, yeah, George, you want to do this? Great. Now that Disney is in charge, yes. these conversations are entirely different. And I, I, again, I don't see George Lucas saying, oh, I don't know about J.J. Abrams. I see him going like, oh, yeah, sure. Okay. You, you have contacts with him? I guess I wouldn't have really, you know, known that. I don't know. But Disney is coming in and saying, no, we're going to get the best director. We're going to get the best writers. We're going to get the best consultants. We're going to take your treatment, George, and we're going to turn this into something amazing. I think you're right about that. Yeah, and I'll t uh, it's it's one of those things where uh, if Disney is beholden to anything, it's it's they're beholden to excellence, and that was not what you got. Everyone was beholden to George, and what George wanted was that was the end of the discussion. But what Disney wants is is just excellence, and I'm and I'm thrilled to see it. Yeah, and Ken from Chicago points out that JJ had said. He he had turned down. I don't know if he said he turned down Star Wars at first or if he had, like, resisted it at first. But it's got to be just because of scheduling. They must have made him, you know, just said, look, a huge let's offer. Make this yeah. happen. Yeah. No, absolutely. And keep in mind for for anyone else who's skeptical, remember that uh, to me, what is hands down the most, uh, the best of all the Star Wars films, Empire Strikes Back, uh, that was the one that George Lucas had the least to do. He outsourced the writing, he outsourced the direction and served only as producer. Uh, and so if we can just capture that magic where, you know, Lucas is there, he's still an influence, he's peeking in on everything, it's his grandbabies out there, but it's this younger, more passionate, uh, and uh, at least in directorial chops, a better talent. I I think it's just going to be amazing. I can't wait. NYC said he was never asked. I don't know what the true story is. I can't imagine that he says no. But let's move on to another big story. Stop everything. It's another big story. Netflix had their earnings report and it was incredible. 
It stunned people. Uh, they were expecting, Netflix was expecting to probably not be profitable by the end of this year. They are. They actually made, what was it, $6.12 million, a record quarter-over-quarter quarter growth. Uh, international subscriber numbers of 6.21. It would be $8 million positive. $8 million positive. Uh, broke a profit. Getting to 27.15 million streaming subscribers, uh, which is, you know, half what a, a decent cable channel gets. So, And on the rise, even the DVD rentals, Business, while declining, has sort of stabilized. It's not declining as fast as it had been. Uh, and and Netflix just seems to be hitting on all cylinders. And they're already saying, look, House of Cards is our defining moment. You know, we're forging ahead with subscribers. Nobody provides the, the breadth of content. There's no replacement for us out there. They're not talking about HBO anymore because they, I think they're starting to see HBO go as a competitor. And HBO starting to make little noises here and there about maybe they will someday go head to head with Netflix. That's not happening anytime soon. But Netflix is saying we need original content. We need reasons for people to come to Netflix that they can't get anywhere else. And that's what House of Cards and Arrested Development are going to be in Q1 and Q2. And, of course, House of Cards premieres February 1st, this Friday. All the episodes at once. How big a difference have we seen since the Quickster debacle, where even on this show, where we're predisposed to love everything Netflix is trying to do, even we were making fun of the, the giant dip in their stock price about how everything seemed to be crumbling around them, other competitors nipping at their heels. And now you look at some of this stuff, like, look at this. This is the price-to-earnings ratio just in uh, in the past year, rocketing up here. And then they uh, they also, in, as part of their announcements, you can see they've got their... Uh, now, this, this is a bit of a fudge here to show how... How big their library is compared to their competitors because they define their top 200 as you know obviously 100 percent of them are netflix choices this doesn't right, really acknowledge right. any of the they're exclusives. saying of our 200 most popular titles these other services Correct. only have this many but e even given that juicing of of the debate they're still 73 is the best you can get to get to yeah. you know that's that's not much well, and the mere fact that they're the ones who are shaping the narrative now, they're back on top. They're they're writing the future of the way we consume media, and it's it's great to see that they're moving forward. I mean, the promotions engine for House of Cards is just so over the top at this point, and I, and I am more excited about that movie now, and or that series now, and of course, that's by design because of the massive exposure that it's been getting over and over and over again, where it's like, uh, I looked at my Netflix history, and it listed me watching the featurette or the promotion that they that automatically played like their advertisement is showing up as its own Netflix item that is automatically being queued up on a lot of uh uh you know whenever you get to the end of a series or whatever so uh I don't know man good good on you guys congratulations just keep making the awesome for us and continue to fight for us that's all we ask yeah, uh, Netflix streaming, uh, also some other things that came out. Uh, Netflix streaming, most dominant on HDTVs. 14% uh, are going through computers. 8% uh, streaming on smartphones. 13% on tablets. Vast majority of people using Netflix are using it on a television. And that's, yeah, and that's what Netflix wants to hear. I would love to see the breakdown, and I'm sure it's out there somewhere, of which of the media devices are being used the most, whether it's the PS3. Uh, I think we heard recently that PS3 was the number one media uh, streaming for, uh, set top box for Netflix, uh, you know, or Xbox or, or the Wii. I know that in my house, you know, I watch my content in my office on my computer, which has a 37 inch monitor that I sit relatively close to, but the kids. Just all day, every day. You look at my history, it's nothing but uh, but cartoons that they'll discover a new series, they'll plow through it, three laps around, get bored with it, move on to another series and start all over again. And uh, another story on The Verge talks about how Netflix was building its own set-top box and Reed Hastings came in and killed the program. They were getting close to launch and he said, nope, we're not doing this. You know why? Because when I call Steve Jobs... And right now, he'll pick up the phone, and I can get Netflix there, and I want Netflix to be everywhere. But if I have a set-top box out there that competes with his product, he won't pick up the phone. So what they did is they gave it to Roku, and that's how we got the Roku box. The Roku no Net kidding. Remember, it was the Roku Netflix streaming player when it first came out. They took what they've been doing on it, and there's like, look, Roku, we know you're working on similar stuff. Here, take the, all, the st all the research we've done. That is amazing. It is so funny far-sighted for him to do that it, it's uh i don't i don't want to get misty eyed and say visionary but like that's the kind of thing you do when you're playing the game thinking about where you're going to be 10 15 years out
Yeah, and, and it's funny because I'm often in favor of companies both putting out their own thing and being available on other platforms, right? Mm -hmm. I think Amazon is brilliant. They put out a Kindle, but they also have an app that you can get on an iPad or on a on an Android tablet. Uh, so I think that's smart. But in this case, what Reed Hastings was looking at was not, oh, is this going to cannibalize us? But will this prevent us from getting on these other platforms? I think Amazon realized, you know, if we've got a Kindle ebook reader, nobody's going to see that as a competitor to an iPad directly. Right. Uh, so, so that's okay. And what Reed re recognized is, no, this is going to be a direct competitor with the Apple TV. And Apple could say what all at once about it being a hobby. They are not going to tolerate us being in that same space. So they're not going to want us on the platform. Now, now they are. And that, that's one of the reasons Netflix is in this position of high subscriber growth and having lots of deals is because they're easily available. Maybe it's not, you know, only 8% on the iPhone, but you can get it on the iPhone. And that, doesn't just help fill out your streaming numbers. It also helps people to feel comfortable like, oh, I like Netflix because I can get it everywhere. Even if I don't right. use it all the time everywhere, what, I just like does, having that opportunity. It take, Anytime you could take a functional piece of your business mo uh, engine and turn it into a marketing arm of it. For example, you know, the, the classic story is how, uh, you know, Disney, all of their resorts are immaculately clean. Now, you got to clean your resorts no matter what, but by going overboard with it, they Per, they perceive that as part of the marketing for their their uh, whole user experience. Same thing with uh, Arrested Development. And this is something that Reed even mentioned in one of his talks recently was, is Arrested Development a content expense or is it a marketing expense? Because obviously they're buying a ton of goodwill. And he didn't say it outright. But there, there if you read between the lines, I thought there was very strong hints that they expected to see a big bump in subscribers because of the, it looked to me like they thought house of cards and then arrested development were going to pay off pretty big in terms of uh, new subscribers yeah i think they don't want to say that because they don't want to affect their guidance from from right. wall street uh so they're trying to moderate those expectations but i i think i think they hope that they'll be surprised uh yeah. and and i uh, you know when we'll see well, I, I, I'm already a Netflix subscriber and I'm excited about it. I'm not sure if I wasn't a Netflix subscriber, if I would go for House of Cards. I probably would for Arrested Development, though. I'll tell you what, man. I'm I'm all in on House of Cards already. Every time I've, I've gotten well, to where I, I, I am too, but I'm just saying if I wasn't a Netflix subscriber, I don't know if the hype machine would be enough to pull me into Netflix or not. But you know, you know what? what? Here's the other thing. Okay, let's say let's say House of Cards is something yeah, like a Breaking Bad or The Wire, where it get it's good enough that you get evangelists out there. It's the kind of thing that could say, well, you should watch the whole thing. And by the way, it's free because Netflix, of course, always does their free 30 day trials. They could sell you on the idea of sign up, binge, and then cancel, and then uh, and sell it that way. Which which that also kind of makes sense for this whole focusing on the binging dynamic that they're doing. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. Is is They want to get you in the door, and then they think they can keep you. And House of Cards and, and Arrested Development both are a way to do that. All I'm saying is Arrested Development gets people without having to prove anything because it's already had a few seasons and people love it. It's a cult hit. There are people right. out there gonna, who are going to sign up for Netflix for no other reason than watch Arrested Development, and then Netflix can do their best to try to keep them. House of Cards is going to have to build more word of mouth. They're going to have to get some attention once it launches to to make people want to come in. It's it's not a guaranteed thing yet, but it is. Yes. I think I think everybody who has Netflix is going to be interested in, in watching at least one episode of it. Absolutely, agreed, a hundred percent. Let's move on to yet another big story. Tuck in your bootstraps. It's yet another big story. New York Times' Brian Stelter has an article up about how Harvard and now Yale are working with a company called Tivoli to provide all of their students a way to watch all of their TV on any device they have as long as it's connected to the university's network. The idea is that instead of providing cable television to the dorm uh, and, and, and getting you in the habit of that old school way of watching television they're providing you cable television to your devices because kids don't bring televisions into the dorm anymore they bring computers they bring tablets they bring smartphones uh so all of the cable channels all of the the channels like the over-the-air channels that the school gets are now available through tivoli over the uh internet network on campus uh as well as things like hbo they got hbo on board to provide hbo go the idea being 
actually they don't want these students to become cord cutters. They want them to get them addicted to broadcast and cable television so that when they do graduate and have jobs and can afford it, they'll miss all of those shows and want to I, subscribe to cable television. I wouldn't put it that way. Uh, but I see I see where you're coming from. But you make it sound a little more nefarious than I think necessarily it is. Because- I'm not trying to make it sound nefarious. This is exactly why the cable companies are allowing this instead of suing Tivoli like they are with Aereo. They want to well- get... People, it says it right in the story. They want to get kids in the habit of liking cable television, and they're uh, worried that if they don't show up on tablets and smartphones, that they'll just lose out and kids won't build that habit. Right, but this is not a case where it's like, uh, uh, it's. I, I thought, as far as the legal framework, I think it is different. It's not black and white uh, like uh, like the Aereo case is, because this is, this is a case where the university is paying subscriptions for all of these things. They're getting their money. And then, uh, so this is much more akin to like a, uh, a sling box type of situation where it's like, yes, we're paying everything. We're just not bothering to run cable to the the um, uh, individual televisions because there's no televisions here. But uh, so so in that regard, I, I don't I don't know that it's as fuzzy as the Aereo situation is, but it is brilliant in that this is a time when there's a reason that piracy runs rampant around among college students because they're not going to pay for any of these things, but they do. Uh, but they're in this place where structurally they're underserved to getting all of this content. So uh, again, we talked about how Netflix is playing beginning with the end in mind. These guys are shaping. Uh, shaping expectations of, you know, getting legal content through these devices, getting it ported to all, you know, wherever they are. So essentially they're recognizing where there was an underserved market. There was a huge, tremendous black market generated as a result of it. And so what they're doing is figuring out something that, again, it looked to me like this is all legal, straight, like it looks exactly like a sling box situation in order yeah, it's, to- Yeah, it's all legal, Brian, but why is it legal? Why aren't uh, broadcast networks and cable networks uh, doing the same thing in people's homes? Well, because I mean, they are. They, they do don't, that with a, they, with Because a they box. don't feel like they need to. If somebody is, people subscribe to cable in great numbers still, they don't, uh, yeah, they're going to do a little TV everywhere, but most people don't use it. There's those numbers in there that people just, they don't access TV everywhere because they're a little confused by it. I've read these numbers that people are like, yeah, I'm aware it's out there, but the passwords and stuff, uh, I don't know. What Tivoli's doing is going to the Nets and saying, these are people you're not getting yet. So get the money out of the university. Allow us to provide the sling boxy aereo uh, type of service. And then when these kids graduate, they won't abandon you. They won't come out of school going like, you know, I never had cable TV in school, so I don't really feel like I need it now. I get my entertainment elsewhere. You want right. to get them familiar and say, oh, well, I still need cable TV. Now, the, the, the flip side of it that I think you're, you're pointing towards is they're also going to want TV everywhere to work. And so right. that doesn't work right now outside of the campus. Well, and in some ways, they're sort of setting up, uh, number one, they're building evangelists of people who are going to demand a certain level of interconnectivity and portability of their media. But then also, it's almost as though they've kind of set a fuse because uh, four years from now when they graduate and they become money makers, and they're like, wait, you mean I can't get these things? Then uh, certainly it's going to put some pressure on. But I think we'll be in a different space four years from now. I think they got plenty of time. Yeah, I I, I think so too. And I, I think... This is actually the Trojan horse that gets the rest of us this kind of system. They're already talking about rolling this out in hospitals, uh, other places that have in, internal networks. Uh, and maybe if they can develop this there, eventually the, the companies start to realize, oh, well, this is a service we, we should really just roll out to everybody. And then, then Aereo goes out of business. Don't take Aereo to court and waste money paying your lawyers to fight them. Do this. Run them out yeah. on your own. That's, that's the way to do it. All right, let's take a quick break and thank our sponsor for today's show, Pond5, the world's stock media marketplace. Brian, what can we tell people about Pond5 that we haven't told them before? Um, let's see. We already mentioned the fact that if you're a media creator, you can sell. Pond5 is, is like a two-way marketplace, right? So if you got some wicked awesome footage that you know other people want to license, you can get some of the best rates in the industry by putting your media up on Pond5. We've already mentioned the fact that it's the perfect place for you to get. And we've played a game. We're always on there. Like, uh, I mean, let's just, just for grin. Uh, what do you got for clowns? Go ahead and throw clowns oh, in Oh, man. There. No, no. Hopefully there's no clown stuff. Oh, look at all the clowns. Brian, the clowns. <laughs> Are you Not scared a funny of clown. <sighs> Do you have an evil clown? I wonder if you could put an evil clown in there. Ooh, I, yeah, that's a good question. How, how specific can you get with the Pond 5 
stock media marketplace. And look at that. You're not you're getting videos, you're getting images, you're getting after effects, you're getting evil, evil male business clown. Yes. Wow. He's <laughs> literally just about anything you paint. can think of. If and the odds are, think about how much time and energy it saves you. You don't have to go out and shoot any of this stuff. It's all there waiting for you. And the odds are they've somebody else has done it better than you would do it yourself anyway. Yeah, so sound effects, customizable motion graphics, 3D models, collections growing all the time. Everything you need if you're making content. And as Brian mentioned, it's a marketplace. They're shaking up the stock agency business with an open, artist-friendly marketplace for professional content. For artists selling on a site, Pond5 gives you control over the pricing. Nobody does that. They pay out 50% royalties for each and every sale. That's higher than most other stock media marketplaces by far. As a result, the prices are unbeatable, and so is the range of quality of content. And this month, you can get 50 free stock media files by going to pond, the number 5com slash frame rate. That's pond5.com slash frame rate. Do it now. Go, go see what they've got there. Set your creativity free. We thank Pond5 for their support of tech. Frame oh, rate. Oh, of good old of tech tech network programs like frame rate like right frame here. Rate. Yeah, exactly. Thank <laughs> this you. Week, tech. <laughs> All right. Let's move into the slipstream. <laughs> this just broke right before the show. I don't know if you saw this yet, uh, Brian, but uh, you know, HBO. I, I saw it. And, and I almost pasted it in there, but I thought that maybe you hadn't put it in there on purpose. Like it was too rumory for us to cover on here. But this this was a little slip of the tongue. I thought was interesting. Yeah, no, it comes from it comes from HBO Go's Twitter account. So I'm pretty sure it's it's for real. Uh, HBO is going to put up episodes of Girls and Enlightened, which normally premiere on Sunday on HBO, and then would come to HBO Go the next day. They're putting the new episodes up now on HBO Go, and then premiering them on television on Saturday because they know everybody's going to be watching the Super Bowl on Sunday. Do you know uh, what? So this is not the story that I thought it was because there was another story that uh, that uh, one of the higher-ups at HBO, when questioned directly about making HBO Go available, had uh, had said, well, we can't do that right now. And then there was... Oh, yeah. Like no, but but that was... <laughs> That's, I mean, they've said that before. That's why I didn't put that story in. He's, he yeah. said, like, well, you know, we... Yeah. You know, well, first of all, he said something really rude, like, well, let me get you a raise so you can afford to buy HBO. Ha, 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 you poor yeah. waitress who can't afford anything. I'm saying and that, that was just a horrible thing. But then it he really said, was. like, well, right now, you know, we, we are, we're in business to promote the cable subscriptions and it wouldn't make sense. But never say never. Uh, that's pretty much not saying anything. That's saying I just insulted someone and I realized it. So let me give them a shred of hope. Agreed. Agreed. But yeah, no, so, but so, but what they are doing, I think, which is really smart, is saying, you know what, we've got a really good digital platform. It doesn't hurt us in the short run. The cable companies all know that no one's going to watch anything but the Super Bowl. That's why things like the Puppy Bowl exist to just try to pull your eyeballs away for a few seconds. The Super Bowl is like a juggernaut in the United States. So no one's going to get mad if HBO puts a show up early because the cable companies sell their subscriptions by people wanting to watch the Super Bowl. In fact, CBS is going to stream the Super Bowl on their website for free because they know that this has absolutely no effect on subscriptions and they're not going to upset anybody. So uh, it's just all about selling ads. Uh, you know, pretty risk-free on HBO's part, but also pretty smart. Yeah, sure. Now, do you happen to know on that streaming that they're doing if it's going to be? I remember last year the big complaint was you got a stream of the Super Bowl, but you got a different set of canned ads. You got the regular subscription, yeah, CPM, no, or whatever. Cool. Are you going to get I, – that's so funny because normally we wouldn't give a crap about the – nobody <laughs> complains like, you know, when I watch Fringe on Hulu, I get different ads than the Fringe on – nobody cares right. except the Super Bowl, right? <laughs> then everybody right. suddenly is like, no, I want to see the Super Bowl ads. That's why I'm watching. I don't even know what football is. Right. Exactly. Uh, yeah, so I don't, I don't know if you're going to get those or not. Of course, you can get all the ads online before the Super Bowl airs anyway, usually. Um, yes. Research in Motion, RIM, the makers of BlackBerry, have revealed that BlackBerry App World is now called BlackBerry World, and they have a movie and TV store. U.S., U.K., and Canada, you can get major studio movies. They have all the major studios on board the day after they come out on DVD in the majority of cases. That's pretty huge. They also have a pretty good TV show deal. Uh, most of their partners are going to allow TV shows to be purchased 
the day after they air. So that's that's uh, that's pretty nice there. They don't have all of the partners. All of the major movie studios that own TV shows, I think they have deals with them, but they don't have things like HBO, for instance. Uh, they don't have A&E. They don't have Discovery on board for this. So a little less comprehensive on the TV side. They also have a music store in there as well with all the major labels on board to buy music. That one's actually available in 18 countries. So I, I, I got a question for you, Tom. Do you sure. think, is this evidence of uh, BlackBerry being a bigger media player than we had previously thought? Or is this evidence of an industry that's much more familiar with this t these types of agreements and much quicker to offer them even to smaller players in the market. Because just, mm -hmm. you know, four years ago, five years ago, it took somebody like a Steve Jobs, you know, plowing forward with the iTunes right. marketplace in order to make something like this happen. That's a very good question because certainly RIM is the beneficiary of those who have tread this path before, right? These deals right. are getting easier to strike as the, as the companies loosen their grip and say, okay, this isn't killing us. We're actually making a little money. And the more people we get making money, the better. We don't want to run into that thing music ran into where Apple dominated everything for a while. Uh, on the other hand, I do think it's a coup on the part of RIM. I, you know, I, I don't see everybody else making these kinds of deals. So I want to give them credit for going in and striking a very comprehensive deal right off the bat. Question is, I, this is absolutely essential to bring BlackBerry 10 up as an operating system for tablets and smartphones to the top, but is it enough to switch someone? I don't think so. I right. mean, this isn't a set-top box. This is tablets and phones. This is, this is playing catch-up, not, uh, not swaying people back. Yeah, I think so. But on the other hand, if you're a BlackBerry user... And you're looking forward to upgrading your phone and get BlackBerry 10. This is great news. So yeah, don't want, don't want to downplay that. Also, Japan planning to broadcast 4K TV in 2014. Uh, that's 3840 by 2160 technology. Uh, according to the Asahi Times, Japanese Internal Affairs and Communications Department will transmit a 4K broadcast of the World Cup in, from Brazil in 2014. Maybe sports. Sports might be the only content that I, that I buy 4K can can make it based on media. But, and it's $25,000 like, for TV right now, but by yeah, 2014, but was, that should be down to 12000 right? Oh, no, even less than that. I mean, it'll happen pretty fast. It'll happen on projectors first, I think. I think that yeah, uh, that's true. the that's scalability what it did with HTV, there. Right. Yeah, correct. So I'm not, I'm not totally down with it. I just think they're barking up the wrong tree trying to sell us on content. But, but sports might be the exception. Like, if you are a crazy sports nut and you really can, it's like you have a window to the game and you can actually see that guy on the other team that you hate. You're like, oh, you uh, and you want to wipe off the sweat off his face. Maybe, maybe those guys. Yeah, and, and, and definitely uh, it's, it's the World Cup. That's the premier sports event in the world. Yeah, so, yeah we think we're starting with our little Super Bowl. <laughs> Forget yeah. that. Uh, global TV platform Vicky has reached a partnership with Amazon Instant. Now, you may or may not know about Vicky, you, but you may be consuming some of their products without knowing it because they already have deals with Hulu, Netflix, and YouTube. Uh, they distribute content through MSN, Yahoo, and China's Ren Ren. What they do is they go out and they find television and movies in overseas markets that are not being that bought or have rights in other markets. And then they bring them to those markets. So, for instance, in the United States, if you go to Vicky's website, you're going to see a ton of Korean content that is not available in the United States. But if you're interested, you can get it through Vicky. Uh, but Vicky is not just trying to get you to come to VIKI.com. They're making these partnerships and reselling. They're basically a clearinghouse. But this really interesting model for turning hits in various parts of the world uh, into hits possibly elsewhere where they might not get a chance otherwise. Well, and what they're doing is they're making, they're making money on the inefficiency from one market to another, right? They don't know which of these Turkish-made programs will become a hit in Argentina. They don't know if one will even hit in Argentina, but they know that somewhere in some country is some, uh, you know, content not currently being licensed globally that they could buy for pennies on the dollar because they don't think they're going to make money any other way and they could find a home for it somewhere else and i wonder i wonder how much of their success will be in uh, you know repurposed content where somebody goes in and provides translations or you know subtitle services they, you know or whatever. what i watched I, I, uh, I watched one episode of one of the korean shows earlier today the mm -hmm. the subtitles were creative commons from their community 
That's the, I, I totally believe that. And, and right now, unfortunately, you know, look at the anime community that's so passionate that they create fan subs. Uh, I'm not going to say who or where, but I may have been handed a bootleg of a uh, of a uh, of Yamato, the the live action Star Blazers movie, with what I was told had the only. Uh, subtitled in English version available in the United States. Like, it's, uh, like nobody has it on the BitTorrents or whatever. Like, this is these people are so committed and passionate in these communities that they commit crimes by translating these things themselves in order to make these fan subs possible. And they do it, and they, they do it smart with Creative Commons. And I hope that it takes an institution like Vicky to pair those things together and make it presentationally uh, palatable to the rest of the world. Yeah, what's pretty cool is that, that, you know, right off the top when you started when I started streaming the show, it said subtitles provided through Creative Commons with the license. And and that's the other thing Vicky's doing because they do have this stuff on their own website. They use their community to kind of determine what's really popular and what's worth taking a chance on to to redistribute out there. Um, I watched a, a panda detective show from Korea. I can't remember the exact name. I'm trying to find it right now, but it was. <laughs> so, is it anything like the Wastelander Panda that we watched a while ago? The like post nuclear. No, no, it's a pa Panda Man Heroic Detective. Uh, <laughs> Amazing. Subtitles brought to you by the Heroic Detective Team, Creative Commons, and then the Vicky uh, Community Address. And then they roll, they roll a pre-roll before every one of these videos. Uh, BBC is partnering with them and helping them learn how to sell the videos on this. So uh, it's pretty good, good stuff. V i k i. Dot com. Uh, also on the international beat, French broadcaster TF1 is doing a second screen mobile app that finally makes me think I might it might be worth trying. Uh, TF1 has something that they call My TF1, which is all their online services, and they're launching a new Connect feature, which allows you, while you're watching TF1 live, on your second screen to replay what you just saw, and not only that, but share it with other users. As in like, oh, man, can you believe that happened? Uh, check it out again. Dude, I, this is brilliant. And this is finally what we've looked for. Up until now, most of the second screen applications that we've seen have not been – they may have been novel, but they, but they haven't been surprising. They've all been the kind of things where it's like if you and me got locked in a room, we'd come up with half these ideas. Oh, director commentary. Oh, trivia. Uh, something. Buy the crap you see on television because – that panders to the advertisers. And, but this is the first thing that I've heard that that spoke to the consumer. Like, that's a thing that would be very difficult and complicated because there are a lot of times I'm watching television and something happens. I was like, did you see that? And Bonnie's like, no, what was it? And maybe we're maybe it happens to be DVR and I could go back and catch it. But then meanwhile, how am I going to get it onto the screen to, to share with Twitter or whatever? And it's like, what, maybe I'll take a photo of the screen or whatever, like I did when I had a comment about The Walking Dead. But to have something like this built in institutionally that almost feels, you know, disruptive and, and naughty, I think is a brilliant thing for them to do. I, it gives me hope for the second screen application experience. All right, let's move on to the tube talks. Tube Top's all about set-top box stuff, basically the services and hardware that bring you the channels that you watch. And uh, there's a new effort getting some attention called Dial. Uh, the Dial Protocol stands for, what does it stand for? Uh, it's so, something about finding apps. Anyway, I can't, I can't find that note now. But what it does is when you're on your tablet or phone and you have a thing like Netflix or Hulu and you have a smart TV that is dial enabled, you can find the app on the smart TV and launch it from your phone. Or you could also stream content straight from your phone no. onto the smart television. No, you it's cannot. not. Wait, 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 wait. That is not what dial does. All but, dial but they, does is find the app on the smart TV and launch it. Now you can select something to stream from your TV from your iPad or your or yes. your Galaxy S3, and then it will launch the app, find it there, and stream it to the TV directly. Now you're making me go back and look at the article again because I got the distinct impression that it was a direct competitor to AirPlay and the AirPlay experience, and that one of the things that it offered was was in addition that you could launch apps but uh but maybe that's not it does the case, not maybe. mirror your screen that's the main it is because it is a competitor for airplay and all for all intents and purposes right what do people use airplay for mostly it's like taking apps and watching what they're watching in the app on their television screen but right what it doesn't do is send it from it doesn't mirror it 
What Dial does is says, okay, we'll find us the same app over there. We'll launch it and start it. That's how the Nexus Q worked, right? Right. You could watch right. YouTube things from your Android phone, but it wasn't sending them from your Android phone. See, in that case, Q. I don't even know why they're talking about it being a competitor to AirPlay. It's like you're not competing with AirPlay until you're mirroring what the content is on the small device because that is going to be key functionality. That is what would make smart televisions all of a sudden top of my list. If if a, essentially a smart television could become a dumb conduit to whatever handheld media or even laptop media I had on me at a time, boom, 100% in. I'll pay the $500,000 premium on my next television to get that. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Web1507, whoever you are. Uh, dial and launch is what uh, the dial stands for. Uh, I'm sorry, download and launch. So the download refers to the fact that if I have Netflix on my iPad and I say, or pff, iPad's a bad example. I got Netflix <laughs> on my and uh, my Galaxy Tab, and I say, oh, I, I want to dial that to my smart TV, and my smart TV hasn't installed the app, it will download the Netflix app and then launch it so that I can then play whatever it is I'm selecting. And you can control. It's a remote app as well. So I think what they're thinking is most people won't know the difference. If right. all they're wanting to do is send video from their Netflix app to the smart TV, this will appear to be doing that. The fact right. that it's downloading it separately won't matter to them. Where it will fail is when they say, oh, well, I also want to do it with the CW app. And Dial says, oh, sorry, CW isn't one of our partner apps. Right. 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 Well, and, and, and there's no reason that this can't be part of the efficiency chain where it's like it, it, you know, you want to send it content and it's like, okay, you're sending me this content. It's not really efficient for me to be streaming it straight from your phone, especially sent. Look, I know where this is. Let me go grab it and go use the app and put it in there. I'm all for making it as efficient as efficient as possible. But again, you know, desktop and, and content mirroring is, is key to, to making this thing get widespread appeal. Now, while we're speaking about the Apple TV, the little hobby from Apple, uh, <laughs> iOS 6.1 came to the tablet and phone today, and uh, Apple TV got a little update as well. One, as we've talked about before, was the forthcoming support for Bluetooth keyboards. Uh, another was the ability to stream music from iCloud. So if you're an iCloud member or if you just have purchased music from the iTunes store, it'll all appear on your Apple TV, and you even get that uh up next feature which was the replacement for the itunes dj now on the apple tv none of these things is crazy revolutionary but they're good features to have especially i don't that know Tom, keyboard, I seems like an awful lot of time and energy going into something that's just a hobby i'm just you saying think, you think they're protesting too much I don't, yeah i'm just saying that's awfully good customer service for something that you're just you know throwing together on the sidesies now, we did mention the uh, the controversy over the hopper uh, and how it was awarded Best of CES and then had Best of CPS stripped from it when CBS came in and told CNET that they could not give that award to someone they're in legal contention with. And CBS still in legal contention. But there are separate lawsuits. There's one for CBS, one for ABC, and one for Fox. And the Consumer Electronics Association, which gave CNET the franchise to give out the Best of CES awards, has filed a friend of the court brief on behalf of Dish saying that the hopper is protected by the Betamax decision way back in the 1980s, Sony Corp versus Universal University City Studios. And that in fact, if they ruled in Fox's favor against the hopper, they would be overturning the Betamax decision and all sorts of uh, fair use that people have for recording their own programs and doing what they will with them uh, would go away. Now, the CEA is an outside, uh, another outside group, right? They're not any kind of legal authority, is it? They, uh, well, they're not, they're, I'm not sure what you mean by that. The Consumer well, Electronics I, I guess Association what, what I'm is like, is, it's a trade group, right? It's a trade right. association. Okay. So essentially so when they what they're doing, a, it, well, yeah, so essentially what they're doing is they're, they're providing a, a vote of confidence, a vote of support and saying, you know, like, I, I mean, obviously, you know, the judge the theoretically. FCC. Is that what correct. you're asked? Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. Correct. Right. They're not right. a government yeah. agency. Correct. Right, right. So, uh, well, I mean, that's good. That's that, that's good. And it's interesting to see them rallying around, uh, you know, picking a side on this, because obviously there's a lot of factors that everyone needs to please when it comes to, you know, you got your content producers and the people making the gizmos. Uh, I think it's interesting that uh, that they so firmly and loudly came on the side of, of, of Dish in this decision. It's actually not surprising. CEO Gary Shapiro of the Consumer Electronics Association has been very good at defending 
device makers for fair use and saying we should not be policing copyright. The, 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 co the companies that make devices should be free to innovate and make devices. He, he's been a big defender of that. So it doesn't surprise me that he does this. And in fact, it kind of disappoints me that he that CEA filed it on behalf of the Fox case instead of the CBS case, because that would have been a little slap back. I feel like I wonder what those conversations have been like, uh, but there's probably legal reasons why you file it in the Fox case first. Maybe it's going to court first or whatever. Uh, but yeah, so it, it's good that for Dish anyway, that they're getting some guns on their side. I think that yeah. means that we should uh, move on to film found. <laughs> So every episode, we tell you about the streaming services. We tell you about the set-top boxes. What are you going to watch on these things? That's what Film Found's about. Hulu and iTunes uh, will be delivering new episodes of two shows that I know Brian and I have been missing. <laughs> a One Life to Live and All My Children. This is a new podcast we're starting up. Uh, all My One Life to Living Children. A tour of your favorite soap operas with Tom and Brian. Now, remember, the, uh, we mentioned the online network was going to take these franchises over and start producing new episodes. And we're like, oh, that's cool. An, an, an actual independent agency taking a storied franchise and saying, hey, we'll make it for the Internet. But the, the other shoe to drop in this story that I didn't realize is how they're going to distribute it is not just on their website. They're going to distribute it on Hulu and on iTunes. Now, and now is that is that a case? Is the story here because the the article sort of portrayed it as you know like uh, you know playing playing multiple di channels of distribution was a big deal? But it seems like there uh, is is that rare for for content to be available both on Hulu and on iTunes? Are they that? See, that's, that that's interesting. When you think about it from broadcast networks, it's not rare at all, right? Right. We got right. Fringe available on Hulu and available on iTunes. There, you know, there's countless examples of that. I think it's striking Ad Robertson at the verge is odd because it's an outside agency that's online already saying we want an outlet. So it'd be like if Netflix said, well, we're going to have House of Cards, but you're also going to be able to buy it on iTunes. That's that's what you, they're thinking of it as. And if you yeah. think of it that way, that would be weird. But the online network is saying, no, we're just acting like CBS, Fox, NBC, ABC, any of those big broadcast networks would, would act. We're finding a streaming outlet. And a download outlet. And we're going to make these available for, for people to buy in lots of different places. And I think that's smart. Right on. Uh, now, uh, when you were talking just then, it sounded a little robotic to me. Do I sound okay to you? I'm having a bit bandwidth hiccup. Everything's okay? Uh, everything sounds fine to me. Jammer B, then we're did, good. Did no, we, I'm sure uh, we're fine. Let's keep on cranking through, uh, through uh, the YouTubers hitting the big screen. Well, maybe, Brian, it was because <laughs> I was talking like a robot. <laughs> right on. Uh, yeah, so the uh, documentary Please Subscribe is coming to theaters on, uh, where is it? February 5th, so this, this coming Tuesday at 7.30 p.m. Uh, lots of theaters nationwide, including Hawaii, so look for it in your local listings. It is about people like Hannah Hart, who have made their way on YouTube and what it's like to produce stuff on YouTube. Now, you might think, well, that's I can just watch these guys. They don't really hide their secrets. They're pretty much out there all the time. But it's a little bit of behind the scenes. You get different things out of them when they get interviewed. It talks about the loneliness of being a YouTube star when you record in your your own home but you you know you've got millions Nobody of fans recognizes you and you just yeah. you just feel like uh, you know all you really invite are thousands of hateful comments on the internet no 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 not at all actually not at all no what the it, it, these are people who don't have majority hateful comments these are people who are loved on youtube these are people with millions of hits these are people who do get recognized they go to a, something like vidcon they get mobbed but they don't go out right i mean right. i'm not saying they never leave their basements but they're not on a big production set Right. They're not you know, they're not doing press tours. Uh, right. So I, I thought that was really interesting. And you'll also be able to get this on demand, of course, via the Chill site, Chill Direct, starting March 22nd. Uh, you, you can pre-order it for six dollars and 20 cents or once it launches on March 22nd, uh, you get it for eight dollars. It is DRM free, though. Just I, I thought it was an interesting documentary. Right on. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you what, the, one of the as aspects of this article was it talked about the um uh, the the novelty that this is going to be hitting the big screen as well as on demand. And I suspect we're going to get fewer and fewer of these stories about like, and it's in a real theater or whatever, as those trappings of what we associate with the authority of quote unquote legitimate content start to fade in meeting. And, and uh, you know, over time, we start to appreciate 
the novel other ways that the internet makes things possible. But for right well, it's, now, it's 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 a great um, you know indicator. You know, it's 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 good that this is happening. I just I just think this uh, as a trend, we're going to see fewer of these these you know wide eyed amazed looks when something like this happens. I I think this is interesting that director Dan Doby said we want to put it in theaters for one day. Because we wanted it to be more of an event. It's not yeah. about being in theaters. He's not saying theaters are better. He's saying, like, we just wanted to do something special. And uh, that's kind of cool to put it in a theater. And I Absolutely. think you, I think that tells more than anything else about the attitude about this. Uh, Jeremy, can we play the trailer? Do you have it queued up? Uh, we're, no. Okay. <laughs> uh, I got the, wait, I can, though. Let's see. That's that's all right. We we can keep. No, no, we're actually running a bit long right now. Anyway, yeah, we've got a uh, we've got another uh, documentary to tell you about. It's not really a documentary. It's this thing called Memorex uh, from Smash TV. Now you may be familiar with Skinamax, which took uh, excerpts from movies and some TV shows from the eighties and just put them to a music track with 55 minutes of cuts, and it was just kind of weird magical trip back to the eighties. They've now done the same thing with commercials and uh, station identification logos, and they've called it Memorex. It's a 50-minute, they call it a VJ Odyssey. Uh, this and, is... Wow. Uh, I, yeah. What do you think well, of this? Okay, I mean, first of all, this is a nostalgia bomb in the back of your skull. It is unreal. As used to, If you are a child of this era, as, as Tom and I both were, uh, as you know, Tom, I don't know if you know this, but every time you have a memory of something uh, and you you uh, think about it or you tell it, you sort of rewrite that memory. And essentially all you're doing is remembering the way you remembered it. And so that's why our memories get so fuzzy and so distorted and, and so far out there. When you see something like this, that is the authentic footage of all these little moments from your past just blasting in your face, it is. It was almost too powerful for me. I, I only watched the first two minutes of it, and I and I immediately stopped because I was like, I must save this for when I'm ready to experience it all at once. It is amazing, and it is, to me, a crime that something so clearly uh, transformative. This is a, There's a ton of content, none of which is owned by the guy who made this. This is nothing. You could make the case that this is a piracy free-for-all. Billions of dollars of content being pinched here and there to cobble together in this extravaganza of illegal you know, reproduction. Uh, and yet, at the same time, what you're seeing is so beautiful collage work of, of a media like nothing we've ever seen before. And it makes me mad that there's no structure available right now in which this guy can be paid directly to sell copies of this to anyone. It's, it, 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 I'm, I'm going to get too upset if I think about it too hard, but this thing is raw beauty, carve out 40 minutes and just prepare to have your mind blown by remembering an entire decade of your youth. All right, then real quickly, uh, My Damn Channel expanding its online programming with the My Damn Channel Comedy Network. Uh, so kind of sp not splintering, but specializing. They're looking for as many comedy shows out there as possible. They're, they're saying, pitch us. Uh, we, we want pilots. So these big channels, these big online channels, uh, both in this case, My Damn Channel has their own website, but is on YouTube as well, uh, starting to act like television networks and searching for new content but with the luxury of saying we can we can bring on hundreds of shows if we want to and try them all out which is something the broadcast networks never could do it was pretty cool seeing them uh, if you're going to be a an internet comedy network uh i enjoyed the fact that they're like yes we want hundreds of new shows coming this fall like just yeah. the ballsiness of a statement like that i think it's i think it's good i think it's time for internet channels to start acting that way i think eventually that'll go away because they'll realize that hundreds of new shows just doesn't allow anything to stand out but sure uh but why not why not try it see, see and learn from it before you figure out what the right number is uh and also uh, the big bang theory's jim parsons is getting involved in thinker channels prodigy series where they interview prodigies you know people usually young people who are talented gifted uh and doing great things he, he was taken with the series so he wants to bring it to television he says because he wants it to have a wider audience. Honestly, uh, they've got 100,000 subscribers there over there at Thinker, so possibly a wider audience. I don't think that's a given, but a, perhaps a, a broader audience, uh, an audience that might not seek it out otherwise, which so I still think it's really cool. Yeah, absolutely.
And it certainly builds up more uh, real geek cred. That's, a, you know, certainly among a lot of uh, internet folks, that show has a, a reputation. I've heard it called geek blackface before, where they're like, they're just poser geeks. It's not real. Well, it's like, well, look at this. This is something that a real geek would do. So eat that. Absolutely. All right. It's time. This is why Brian has been hurrying us along, actually. It's, it's time for the last check-in on the winter <laughs> movie draft. <laughs> Congratulations, Brian Brushwood. It is now official. We all knew it last week, but you are the winter movie draft champion by a mere four million. Not so close, dude. So unbelievably close. In fact, I'd be interested to see what the numbers would be had we extended it by another week. Because it, I think if it went another week or certainly another two weeks, I think Scott would have eked his way past me. This was a blast. The nail bitiest of all of them. And uh, just quick to point out, first two-time winner in the history of the draft. First uh, winter and summer winner in the draft. Uh, not going to claim any of it as skill. All luck. My strategy is always to get as many of the wild cards as possible and hope one of them turns out to be an explosion. It was a lot of fun. Well, congratulations. I uh, can't wait for the summer draft. And uh, we're back into premiering this week. We don't need to play the intro, but Warm Bodies, uh, the zombie movie, about a zombie, zombie who love to story. again uh, yeah. is coming out of the theaters this week, uh, along with a bunch of Oscar documentaries and shorts and stuff like that. So be on the lookout for those as well. Let's talk about what we're watching. What we're watching. I finally did see the season ender of Fringe, and it was good, not great. Uh, it was a nice goodbye to the series. It did wrap up the season well. I'm not sure it wrapped up the series well, but uh, you want to know what I think? Just go read Charlie Jane Anders' review on io9. Pretty much echo everything she said. Uh, uh, I also watched The Following. Have you heard about this? The Kevin Bacon series? No. It's about I have a serial killer who kills by getting followers on the internet to do his bidding. Oh, is this is this one of those like uh, like Dungeons and Dragons is going to make your kids all commit suicide? It's it has a little hint of that, but they don't they don't beat you over the head with it. It's more about the charisma of a guy and what he can do to persuade people. What what people will do because they they just think danger is cool or they can be led by the nose. So it's it's less about the internet is bad and just like people are fools and the internet is a tool that can turn them into fools sometimes and and. I didn't love the first episode. It was rife with cliches. But by the end of it, when they throw the serial killer, and this is a spoiler. So, all right, I'm going to spoil the ending for you a little bit. But they take him back, ready, to prison, and he can still kill from prison. You know this. They, they don't even care. They're like, so he's back in prison. We know what he can do now because he didn't do much even when he escaped from prison. Uh, and he he has, you know, these unknown followers and you never know who you're looking at might be one of his followers even people you know anyone is a danger so uh somebody in the chat room called it uh if uh, charles manson had access to the internet and was able to inspire that level of of cult-like uh, yeah young charles manson friends. yeah yeah exactly anything else you're watching oh yeah i'm watching top chef i watched the last episode of twin peaks uh, back to, back into watching Arrow. I've been binging on old Futuramas. In fact, when I was in Salt Lake City this weekend uh, doing some autopilot stuff with Scott Johnson, we just sat down and watched like four episodes of Futurama um, just because you can. It's fun. Yeah. I uh, uh, Now, you're watching Archer week to week. I think I'm going to save it up and binge on Archer all at once. Give oh, it yeah? a little while here. Yeah, I like so. uh, liked, there's a Bob's Burgers reference right at the beginning of the season premiere of Archer uh, two weeks ago. Uh, so I've been watching a ton of Portlandia, just plowing through those one after another, which is such the power. It's like whatever you're watching gets a bump in perceived quality when you can watch them all straight through. Because I don't know if I just watched an episode here, an episode there of Portlandia. I don't think I would have dove right into it. But the ability of knowing no matter how good or bad this sketch is, I'm only five minutes away from a totally different take on everything. So uh, it's easy to plow through that. And uh, I ran across there was an io9 article about uh, uh, animated short called The Reward. And if you want to take nine minutes to see something adorable, something that's uh, animated a little bit like Adventure Time, 
Uh, there's no dialogue spoken during it, uh, but it's really engaging and and it made me smile. Uh, go to Vimeo and just search for the reward. T H E space R E W A R D. Maybe just watch it, not knowing anything about it. It's not going to blow your mind like nothing you've ever seen, but it's just so perfect for what it is. How about that? Now it's time for feedback. Now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on. Yeah. Brian, if you could pick just one email to read before we end the show, which one would you pick? It would be, uh, let's do Ryan, who wanted to chime in on the idea of something um, being no longer your own as a geek. He says, uh, just fin- to Frame Rate, just finished watching Frame Rate 109, and after listening to Ian's feedback about Doctor Who fans, I realized something. While I understand the feeling when some when people jump on things I love, and I know how I hate it because they don't love it the way I do, and I was there first, and how dare they, it even happens to me from time to time. But... I don't feel this way about Firefly, as an example, at all. I bought two copies of Firefly just so I could hand out the series to friends because I wanted them to see this awesome thing. I still don't know why there's a difference, and I do unabashedly love the series, but there's a decidedly different feeling about it. Is there something out there that you just love to share with others because it is awesome and you think they should have it in their life? And I would say the moment I read this, I thought, well, yes, because Firefly never took fire the way uh, Doctor Who did. You you are in the romance phase with Firefly, and because it died young and will never be reborn, you will perpetually forever stay in that young romance phase with it, and you will continue to share it with anyone who listened to you for three seconds about it because you will never have the risk of running into that Doctor Who phase where all of a sudden it was like, oh, yeah, no, I know that. It's the guy with, like, the magic wand. It's like you're never going to encounter that with Firefly, which is why you can continue to love it with all your heart right now. It lived fast, died young, and left a beautiful corpus of one half season of episodes. Uh, All right, I'm going to read Derek's email. He says, I agree with both your points regarding the Machinima story last week in terms of what both parties should have done. I wanted to give another angle, though, having worked with Machinima on several occasions. While much of the talent that Machinima recruited already developed large audiences before they were hired, Machinima does quite a lot for them as well. Though these advertising deals, through these advertising deals, these filmmakers and producers get access to things they normally couldn't get on their own. For example, they can get early access to a video game or get a private advanced screening to a film as part of an advertising program. Through these deals, they also get invited to industry and marketing events, including San Diego Comic-Con, E3, etc., and get substantial budgets to do some pretty creative work. Additionally, as part of a larger advertising program, Machinima also drives a lot of traffic to these custom videos, which only brings in more fame and fans for these filmmakers. There's much more of a symbiotic relationship than what the complainers let on. Personally, I still have to echo Brian's argument that those who sign with Machinima or any corporate entity need to remember that basic premise of fully reading one's contract before signing one should always look before they leap, no matter how bright that pot of gold looks. Yeah, and, and keep in mind, I don't think I was saying that by any stretch it was a good agreement that they were getting into. But I did want to push back on the idea that it was automatically uh, evil because there are trade-offs. There are, there are things you do when you switch over to a work-for-hire environment that, uh, that you are trading the, the fact that I will not own this. And, uh, and in exchange, I'm going to reach a bigger platform and get advantages like what Derek was, was talking about. Yeah, I don't disagree with anything Derek said, and I thought we we made those points, probably not as well as he makes them here, that there is they are certainly getting something from Machinima when they sign these agreements. My other side of the argument uh, here is that you to look before you leap, you have to know what to look for. And a lot of these kids' cases, they were rising stars, and there is the possibility that an entity like Machinima could take advantage of someone who doesn't know better. Just sign here, sign on the bottom line. You know, yeah, I could read through that. Maybe they read through that and they just didn't understand the implications of it. When it says anything you make on YouTube belongs to Machinima, do they realize that means anything? And if this contract never has an end, anything they make for the rest of their lives might end up there. I'm not sure that that's what these contracts said. We had an emailer who is, who asserted that that's how they worked. I'm not 100% certain that is. But there is a certain responsibility on behalf of the company when you're dealing with young talent not to take advantage of them. Uh, and, and, and so you know, the emphasis here should be that if you are young talent and you're going to sign, get good advice. Find people right. to trust. But that doesn't excuse the corporation for just ripping them off blind if they do that. 
That's all I'm right. saying. Well, and, and keep in mind also, like, let, let's just all agree that this is a universally douchebaggy uh, contract that they that they were getting people to sign. They over asked. It was inappropriate. They did what young institutions in an emerging market do, and they asked an inappropriate amount. And that's why we likened it to the early days of Hollywood. And again, if what you want is for uh, a revolution in content like this. The fact that this horrible thing is happening is a good sign because that's what eventually becomes a robust market. Right. And uh, and I th so so again, not happy for people getting screwed. Am happy that we're seeing the type of ugly things that happen when a new market matures. How about that? It's, Doug L says in the chat room, learn the meaning of in perpetuity. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> That's good advice. <laughs> All right, that's it for this episode of Frame Rate. Thanks everybody uh, for watching or listening. Uh, oh, would... I, I do have one one quick thing. Can I pipe in real quick? Yeah, uh, of course. This is the first broadcast that we've ever done from uh, our friends over at Doghouse Systems. You remember they were a sponsor on the short lived but absolutely wonderful game on here on the Twit Network. Uh, I've been talking for a long time about how by upgrading the cameras in here, I had exceeded the capability of what my PC was able to do. They just hit me up and they're like, what would it take to give you exquisite uh, presentation? And I wrote them a, a dream list of the type of powerful system it would make to do this live switching and be able to do all this on, on the fly. And they made magic happen. They sent something. They even renamed it the Max Troll Box. After the fine folks, uh, you know, after Max Trollbot from Game On, and uh, it's got custom art on there. Um, just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you to the folks at Doghouse. And they even set up a, a promo code if you want to show your support for them supporting this studio right here. It's uh, doghousesystems.com. And if you use promo code SHWOOD, S-H-W-O-O-D at checkout, you could get the exact same box art for Max Trollbox as I have here. And uh, I'll send you like $100 of loot from my Scam Stuff st store as well. Thank you guys so much, Doghouse. You can find us on the web, twit.tv slash FR. We're live every Monday about 3.30 p.m. Pacific, 6.30 Eastern. And of course, you can email us framerate at twit.tv. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Oh, wait, this hold episode. on. It, sorry. It occurred to me <laughs> yeah, you're going to hear yourself time. No, 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 no. But that's because the last thing I remember is that you've got to, you've got to hear, you, it's got to get synced so you don't hear yourself back. I'm not hearing myself back. Well, because now you're synced. Now you're <laughs> <laughs> All right. We good? Yes. This is like when we leave the house and Eileen's like, yeah, I'm ready. Then we get to the door. Oh, hold on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, check it and get your keys. It's fine.